So yesterday we did discuss regression. We talked about correlation and regression. And so we said we use regression to be able to predict or classify an outcome. We may predict ourselves for next month. We may predict whether the student will be admitted to the institution or not. We may predict whether a customer will pay back a loan or not. We may predict the price that we can pay for a house we want to buy or a rent, uh, among others, right? So basically, that's what we said. We equally emphasize that uh, regression is at the core of statistics because many applications are built on the principles of regression. So it's important for a data analyst to understand. We came out with different types of regression. Here we say we could broadly divide our regressions into three. We have linear regression, we have logistic regression, and we have a complex or nonlinear regression. And for the linear regression, we said we could divide them in terms of the number of independent variables we have. And so if you have just one independent variable and one dependent variable, we classify it as a simple linear regression. If we have one independent variable, I mean more than one independent variable, we classify it as multiple regression. Another, we say we could classify regression in terms of time. When the data was collected, I was using it. And so that gives us time series analysis. And in this case, we agreed that uh, we could classify our regression in terms of cross-sectional when the data is collected at a particular point in time or longitudinal when we have the data across different time periods. For instance, we may want to evaluate for five, ten years, twenty years. And so with such analysis, time is the dependent variable. Time is a dependent variable. And we see the changes. That's what we said. From there, we said with logistic regression, unlike the linear regression where we're doing prediction, logistic regression deals with classification. When we say classifying, we want, we are basically saying that we put items in different categories. And so uh, we use logistic regression when our dependent variable is categorical. The dependent variable could be binary. And in the case of a binary logistic regression, the outcome has two options only. And so our dependent variable has two options, we yes or not true, false, paid or not paid, affected, not affected, interested, not interested, happy, not happy, satisfied, not satisfied, and so on and so forth. There are different things we can measure. But then there are situations where we may have more than two options. We could have three. And so when we have more than two options, then the type of regression we use be multinominal. So if we had maybe classification of best performance into uh, best performer, average performer, mobile poor performance, then we could we'll use multinominal logistic regression. And so in this case, we have we can have multiple dependent variables. 
And uh, I want, in, I mean, multiple independent variables, one dependent variable. We said, apart from this, we may have an ordinal variable, which means there is an order, there's a hierarchy. So if we have such type, we classify it as ordinal logistic regression. So we want to follow a hierarchy. Maybe the best performance, the average performance, the worst performance, or poor performance. So that's still under classification. We have probit, we have Poisson, and many others. However, we all agree that based on our outline, will be limited to linear regression. We will see simple regression, we'll see multiple regression. And from there, went on to talk on assumptions of the linear regression. We say linear regression has a series of assumptions that you need to verify before you conclude that the results you are getting will be highly be valid. One of the assumptions we indicated was normality. We expect that data should be normally distributed. And we emphasize when it comes to linear regression, um, interest is highly on the independent variable. I mean, the dependent variables variance. If the variance are distributed following a normal distribution, we said to test this, we have different options. Uh, I mean, we can use the Q, Q plot where we we'll plot our predicted versus residual to verify that. And from there, we said other assumptions are that of autocorrelation, collinearity, and we need to verify. For autocorrelation, we said, uh, this is when we have, uh, especially with time series data, such that uh, there is a lot of interdependence by the word auto amongst a variable. For instance, the sales for this year depends on uh, last year. So when we have such a data set, we will need to try to solve the problem. And we indicated that uh, uh, to test for autocorrelation, we have a test known as the Dobin waxing test. The Watson test helps us. And according to this test, normally our variables range between zero, I mean, the values range between zero and four. And so if you have between zero and one, I mean, zero and two, then we say that we have a positive autocorrelation. Two to four, we have negative autocorrelation. And the two is that the indication of autocorrelation. However, we all agreed that uh, we we'll always have a certain degree of autocorrelation. But then at times we have a range of acceptable values. And we agree that between 1.5 and 2.5, we conclude that the data is normal for us to use. We don't have issues, major issues with our data as autocorrelation is concerned. And we equally said autocorrelation only comes in when you are dealing with time series data. And so you will not have it for cross-sectional data. Another thing we are saying with respect to is collinearity. Now, when we have more than one independent variable, we run the risk of having what we call the collinearity issues. And we said collinearity is when there is high correlation between independent variables in our studies, some independent variable. We gave an example, and the example I think we gave was talking about uh, uh, determinants of academic performance. What we saw was, the use of or maybe class attendance, use of textbooks and income. And we said at times you may not be able to use 
income and textbooks because they might be highly correlated. We're just giving us an example. That's not, we don't conclude that statistically what is, but that is a possibility. So for, for us to test for coloniality, there are different options. We can use correlation metrics where we are looking for correlation metrics. And correlation metrics basically gives us the relationship between our independent variables. And if we have correlation coefficients greater than 0.8, it means there are possibilities of coloniality issues among the variables. We said apart from correlation metrics, we equally have variance inflation factor, commonly known as VIF. Now for VIF, the expectation is that our value should range between zero and one and 10. If our values are above 10, it's a pointer that we might have issues of correlation in, I mean, coloniality in our data set. And so that's what we express. However, the amount of this, we can always see how to solve them. And we also talk about homo sedacity and hero sedacity as some other assumptions to verify. We said homo sedacity is similar to what we saw when we were doing uh, ANOVA, where we talk of homogeneity. We want to assume that the data comes from the residuals that are normally distributed at the same time, the variance should be. And so we try to examine that. In case we don't have any of these assumptions is violated and we cannot solve the problem, we might need to do what? Look for alternative ways. And we said again, just for reminding us to remind ourselves that the linear regression, the most common, the different methods that we use, different techniques, but the most common technique is what we call the least square method or the ordinary least square method, which is a method that gives a possibility uh, that uh, optimizes or you say it goes for reducing, taking the line of best fit that reduces the number of errors that we commit from our expected and actual. So we talk about residuals and uh, the actual. So the difference between expected and actual of our your dependent variable is what we consider to be a residual. And that is what we say. We saw how the model is stated in form, maybe why is a function of f of x, where f of x constitutes your independent variables. And mathematically, we say y is the same as b0 plus bx1, bx2, and so on and so forth. So n, where we said the b0, as we know, represents the constant, the part of our dependent variable that is independent of our independent variables. I hope that statement is not complicated. But we're saying is the part of our independent variable, our dependent variable that do not rely on the independent variables that we have put. I'm just giving a revision of what we did yesterday, so I'm not explaining anything new. So I'm not, I don't have any slides. We, we, are, we are all looking at the same screen. I'm doing a review of what we did yesterday. So that's what we, we said before. So uh, we said, apart from that, for logistic regression, most of the times we use the maximum likelihood. What are the chances that you belong to group A or group B? The higher your probability of falling in one group, maybe above the threshold of 0.5, then you are classified under. You get the example. 
If you want to give her the loan, the question you're asking to what extent can this person pay back the loan? Logically, if the person score high on the ability to pay back, you'll give the person the loan, right? Because that's just what regression helps us to do. And as we saw yesterday, and now we have taken the first 25 or so minutes to do a review. Any question from what we did, from what I've stated before we continue? Those who went and studied to revise, any question? Automatic regression. I don't know anything else. Automatic regression. Which one? Automatic regression. Auto correlation. Auto correlation. Ah. You say auto correlation M series data. Now the issue is when you collect data, let's say we are working with data across different time periods. There's a tendency that uh, this year's value affects the next year's value, all right? So most attempts, regression, you don't want that there should be a lot of interdependence. Because if I predict your performance, just give us an example, then we will not want to use me and you in the same data set, right? Because it's like I already cover your contribution. So we don't need to bring in the two contributions because we've contributed, bring in the two, they will not give us reliable results. So if your performance is extremely dependent on me, it's like if your income depends on my income, then when they're calculating income, they don't need to count you as an independent person. They just count me and it covers you, right? So you don't have any income, rather you depend on my income. So if they count me that, okay, I have 100,000 and you have 50, I'm the one who gave you 50,000. At the end of the year, we're saying that we have 150,000, but which is not real. Actually, the real money is 100,000, right? Because your income depends. That's what autocorrelation tries to resolve. That if one variable or values depend on another, then there is an issue. If you run regression, the issue is always that the output that you get, the findings will not be reliable. Your R squared will not be reliable, as we'll see. And so cannot help you to make what? Informed decision. That's why there's a problem. But that only comes in auto collision, only comes in when we're dealing with time series data. If it's cross section, we don't have that issue of auto collision. <clears throat> so, any question again? Any question? The, no, you don't check for all. We say for all, what do you mean for all? No, logistic regression doesn't use the best fitting line. It uses something else. Actually, logistic regression uses, uh, if you're doing with binary, what we call the, sim, uh, uh, the sim, sim, sigmoid curve, like S shape has an X shape, right? Because it deals with, uh, it has to do a lock. So log range between zero and uh, uh, the log infinity, normally log range between negative infinity and positive infinity, right? But you need to transform it such that from there, your values will range between zero and one. There's a transformation that will range between zero and one. So when you are dealing with logistic regression, your value must be between zero and one, which means if somebody, for instance, 
will you pass an exam? If your probability of passing an exam is 0.4, you consider you fail. If your probability is above 0.5, you consider you pass. So we use better small curve. We will not see that now. So the line of base fit is just for linear regression. Okay. And you don't need to, you don't need even need the line. You know, necessarily need to see the line yeah, come out. The rest of the thing is done by the system behind. So we all agree yesterday that when we come today, we'll start with correlation. So the data set we have, we want to first start by running some correlation. I believe everybody. And we, we want to say, saying that correlation establish the relationship between two variables. That's what correlation does. And so when we are running our correlation, there are different Besides, there are different types of correlation. Just to say, we have So, when we are running, we want we have our correlation, normally correlation value range between zero and one. Can I have a pen? Uh, let's see. Yeah. Okay, I hope those online can see my slides. Let's see if I have slides. So our correlation range between zero and one, right? I'm not disturbing you. Uh, Please just give me a minute. Let me share data here for those who are coming in late. So normally, before the interruption, we send that a range between zero and one when you are running a correlation. So the value always between negative one and one and one. So it's like a number line. At the center, we have our zero. Now, if your value falls here. Maybe let's assume your value is negative 0.5. It means there is a negative relationship between your variables. For instance, we are looking at from the data set we have here. I think the data set talks about uh, study time and the uh, exam score, right? Study time and exam score. The question we're asking. What is the relationship between the study time and uh, the, your score in exams or your performance? And so when we run our regression, our expectation is that the value should be between zero and one. Not a correlation, I mean, sorry, our correlation. Correlation comes from covariance. Covariance establishes the relationship between two variables, right? But the challenge, why most attempts we don't use covariance is that if we find it difficult to compare, you can say, okay, if you look at the correlation that we're running here, we have study time is measured maybe in terms of max, right? I mean, study time is measured in terms of hours, but exams performance is measured in terms of what? Max. So what happens? How do you now compare the relationship between Exams measured in max and uh, uh, time of study, which is measured in hours, becomes difficult. That's what we can do with correlation, I mean, covariance. But with correlation, we take kind of a square root. 
We're not going through the mathematical reasoning behind. So now bring the values to a uniform unit. It's like we are converting frequencies to percentages so that we can now compare proportions. So at this particular point, we intend to compare and see the nature of the relationship between our dependent and our independent variable. And what helps us to do that is correlation. We said yesterday that correlation just tells us that the two variables are related. It has no ability to say whether these variables, one is influencing the other or which one is influencing the other. And so taking the case of our exam's performance, at the time of study, the value must be between negative one and one. So anytime you see your correlation value to be greater than one or less than negative one indicates that there's an issue, there's something wrong. Do you get that? Yes, your value cannot grow, come out of that range. Now, how do you interpret the values? If your value is negative one, exactly, it means there's a perfect positive negative relationship, right? There's a perfect negative relationship. In other words, we're saying that the two variables are direct opposite each other. For instance, we may say that um, rain and sunshine, they are directly opposite. When rain is falling, we don't have sunshine, right? That's a general assumption. So they are directly opposite each other. The occurrence of one may be at the extreme of the other. Do we get it? In other words, we're saying that as one variable is increasing, the other is reducing. If our value is negative one, if it is positive one, then we have a positive, a perfect positive relationship. Most at times we have a value of one when we are looking at the correlation between something and itself. You get that. Even twins, their correlation cannot be one because they might be very identical. Yes, they want to dress the same, but there are some certain things that make them different. But if there's something exactly something and itself, then the correlation will be one, in which case will be a perfect correlation. Right? In between the lines, we cannot have our correlation to be that be strong, moderate, weak, or very low, or you might want to classify. For instance, if you have a value of 0.8, maybe to one or 0.9599, we describe it to be a very strong correlation. So it could be strong positive, strong negative, right? Yeah, it can be a strong positive correlation, meaning that the two variables that are highly correlated and they move in the same direction or strong neg negative, which says that the two variables are not, they're moving in opposite direction, but with a strong relationship. So it could be moderate, let's say 0 0.4 to 0 0.79 or so. We may classify it. Others break in more than this. And uh, we have weak, relationship and it is between 0 0.0 to 0 0.01 to maybe 0 0.4, right? And a value of zero means the two variables are not related. The share basically share not in common. We have a value of zero. So that's how correlation can be interpreted and understood. Any worry? as correlation is concerned. Anyone? Okay. I don't think that there's a worry. So let's go back to our PowerPoint. I mean, to our data set and uh, try to do now a practical exercise. So I have the data here. We want to check the correlation that exists between these variables. There are certain things I will not say as we progress, I will talk about the different types of correlation. Now we have exam score as spent studying, anxiety level, and uh, A level entering point. Here, these three variables constitute our independent variables that we want to predict what will be your exam. 
the, the exam's performance, measure in terms of marks, right? Based on the length of time you spend studying, the level of anxiety you expressed before entering to write the exams, and uh, what was your GPA or your, how do you call it now? Uh, your grades from the advanced level. Let's assume that this is a situation in the university, right? So, but before we go into examine that, it's important for us to very, it's important for us to quickly examine the relationship between some of these variables. We will need to examine the relationship between exam score and studying app. And to do that in SPSS, you need to go to analyze, click on correlate. Correlate talks about correlation. Now here we have different types of correlation, which we'll see just will be very much interested in bivariate. We have partial distance and conical correlation, but our interest here will just be bivariate correlation, right? We we'll take bivariate. And so once you take bivariate, you will see that they give you room to transfer the variables. Now, why do we just say variables? They have not said dependent and independent. I will see elsewhere, right? Because we don't have independent and dependent when it comes to correlation. We don't really consider that there's what? Independent variable and there's dependent. So in, remember yesterday we said, either you take X on Y or Y on X, a correlation is concerned. It doesn't make any difference. That's just what we are saying. So we can put our exam score, uh, the time spent. Now we have two types of different types of correlation. We have correlation coefficient for Pearson. We have Kendall and Spearman. It is important for us to know that Pearson is the parametric, it's a parametric is parametric, which means it assumes that the data is normally distributed, right? We don't need to go and test for normality. Otherwise, that's something we ought to do, but we have already done that. So it assumes that the data is normally distributed. There are, not, there are no significant outliers in your data and so on and so forth, right? So that is what we have. So for Spearman is a non-parametric and Spearman, we use it often when our data is ordinal. We have ordinal data, then we can use Spearman. Kendall and uh, Kendall Tau is the same as Spearman, but the difference is the level of sensitivity with a sample size. If your sample size is small, you may want to use Kendall. But most often, and in most studies, you will see, you either see Spearman or Pearson, because those are the renowned correlations. When you run the two, you may have slight differences in the outcomes, right? Because there are different mathematical models in arriving at this, uh, this different equation. If you click on uh, options, we have mean and standard deviation, cross deviations. I don't really think that there's anything useful there. So we can just simply take, okay, uh, without any waste of time, we have our output. Now, this is our output and uh, we can see our value. Now, before we even go in to interpret our results, what is our expectation? What do we expect? What should be our expectation? According to Lizzie, she says that our expectation is that the relationship between uh, time spent studying and your exam score should be what? Positive. Positive and significant, right? It should be a positive, yeah, significant yeah. relationship. That is our expectation. Which means the more you spend time studying, right, the more or the higher your score. That is basically putting in the layman's term. Remember, we are interpreting statistics. Most of the question is because from the layman's perspective, you avoid all your favorite grammar and say the results now in a way that makes meaning to a common man. So that's our expectation. So let's go to our output again and see our output. We discovered that from the results, we have, if we take this and uh, 
Let me just take it and go to uh, I think I have Microsoft Word open. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, what is it? Yeah. Oh my God. So I have my outputs here. So this is my output. What you notice is that we have the correlation between the variable and itself. For instance, we have correlation between exam score and exam score and the value is one, right? We are earlier indicated that anything with itself will give us a value of one because it's a perfect positive correlation, right? Then the correlation between exam score and time spent revising is 0 0.821, 821. And so in order for us to see whether it's significant, you look at the significant value as we've already indicated, right? SPSS even goes ahead to flag whether the results are significant or not. That is by indicating Double stars, what does it, what do we, do we see double star? What is the implication? It says correlation is significant at the 0.001 level, which means 99%, right? Uh, so either you check from here or if there's this, you can easily conclude. So what are we saying? We are saying that there is, there is a positive, positive and significant relationship, right? Between exam score and what? As spend, Revise our R is the same as zero point eight two one and P less than zero point zero zero one. So to say, All right? So basically, that's our interpretation of correlation, straightforward. This part below, since correlation is symmetric, the other part under is representing the same information, right? It's symmetric. So now they're just bringing now 10 spent first before the, so it gives us the same or a resource. So if we are presenting, we do not need to bring in, can just put something of this nature and then our results will still be very reliable. So in sum, when we are presenting correlation, we are trying to establish whether the two variables they move in the same direction or opposite directions, or they're not related. In other words, if we had a value of zero here, maybe something this. It tells us that there is no relationship between the time spent revising and our exam score, right? But if the value, let's bring it back, was 0 0.03, then it tells us that there is what? Okay, there's something I never added to this. We said there is a, Strong, right? A strong, positive, and significant. So we are given one. The nature of the relationship is positive. The strength of the relationship, whether strong or weak, and then whether the relationship is significant or insignificant. Do we get that? So when you are presenting correlation, those are the key things that are vital. The direction of the relationship, 
the strength of the relationship and if the relationship is significant or not. And so that's what we expect. So if the value now was 0 0.00031, then it will be a weak positive, right? And let's assume there was no significant. So it can be a weak the insignificant relationship between this and you write out the values. If it was negative, they will be saying that there is what? A weak and insignificant, weak, negative, right? So that's how to interpret your results when you are dealing with correlation. Remember we said how to format your tables and the rest. You need to know how to do that. If you don't know, go and learn how to format tables, especially using the APA. As most persons, it is one of the most recommended table format. So I don't need to teach you that. Okay. Any worry? So, yes. Hello. Yes. Yes, sir. You you talk of uh, that the, that the, that we can know the we can choose the the method to analyze based on uh, on the size of the population. For example, you see when the when the size of the data is large, we can use Piersman correlation. Now, but my question is. What qualifies that a data is large? What is what qualifies that a, a, a data is large? Is there a given boundary? Is there a given boundary that you know that if your data is up to this level, you consider that it's large? Uh, that's a difficult one now. In that way, we say the sample size should be adequate. Uh, most of the time, it's subjective. For instance, when we are dealing with normality, we said if a sample is above 50, if we're dealing with regression, then we use 30. So it's relative. But most of the times, I also said the most common that you see that they use would be the Pearson. If your data is ordinal and you are not working from a predefined population, you are assuming that the data don't come from a predefined population. And away from that, you can use now. Uh, if you know that your data comes from a predetermined population and your data is all, I mean, all your dependent variables, you are, you are using dependent, dependent variable continuous, right? So you should yeah. use the Pearson. Pearson is parametric, that which means distribution. Your data comes from a specific distribution and the uh, Spearman is non parametric. So that's basically the, 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 the major classification. The others are just key statistics that might, but you, you see that even in literature, if you look at papers online, you see that most persons don't really use the other ones that much. At the end of the day, if, okay, let's just try something to see if there is a significant difference when it comes to those two outcomes. So let's take the Spearman and we run the same. So we take the Spearman, we run. Uh, uh, you no, know, you take the two, the two still give you the first one up would be Pearson, the second would be Spearman. You see that they touch a non parametric correlation, right? And so Spearman, uh, you see that there's a slight difference. The correlation coefficient has increased from 0.821 to 0 0.90. So there's a slight increase. So that is just the major, but all of them still end up that is what? Strong, significant, and positive. Now, another person I've said they was trying to find out with respect to the one sample or, I mean, the two-tail test. We only talk about two-tail test in this class, which we agree that if we take two-tail test, 
it means you don't specify the direction of the movement, right? We are saying it could be an increase or a decrease. It could be negative or positive. But if you know that it's an increase, you can take one step, which means you know the direction. Directional in your hypothesis. So that's just the major difference. Any question again? Madam Solange, any question? Um, please, I have a question. Yes. Right. Yes, this the um, level of significance here, from what you explained, um, I don't know, correlation is significant at 0 0.01. Does it mean that the below 0 0.01, you consider it significant? I just want to be very clear. Correlation, normally, we have talked about significance of a test. You are testing hypothesis. When do you conclude that significant or not? We indicated 95, we indicated 99, we indicated 90. Mm -hmm. And we said, out of that, you can still choose maybe 70. It just depends on you. Okay. But traditionally, or from the uh, more traditional approach, we use 95. So the expectation okay. is that if your probability or the sig value, as you see in SPSS, is less than 0 0.05, then we conclude that there is a significant association, there's a significant relationship, there's a significant effect, whatever you're trying to examine. But okay. with okay. correlation, they have gone ahead to tell us that the correlation is significant at 0, 0, which means they're saying that it's significant at 99, right? Uh -huh. At 99. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean that if you took 95, it would still be significant because it's still less than 0 0.05. Okay. Yes. Okay, understood. Yeah. Anybody who is angry again? Madam Solange, I expect a question from you. No, you still came late today. When a review of yesterday's class has gone. So, if there's no question, uh, I want us to take a few minutes run the correlation between exam score level of anxiety, exam score and entry level GPA, and interpret our results. I'm giving 10 minutes for that exercise. Nobody's ready to share his uh, result online. Okay, let's continue now. I assume we've all understood. People just online, they have gone and they're enjoying their life. So that's all for correlation and regression. I mean, correlation. So now we state correlation establish relationship between two variables. The correlation fails to establish effect. So it's not about causality. So we wanted to do examine the effect of one variable or another. We'll look for different classical technique. And one of the one techniques we use is regression. So using the same data, we want to evaluate if correlation, I mean, stand, sprain, studying, level of anxiety, and entry level points have influence on the GPA. So we are asking the question, what is the effect of time span Revising on your performance, the level of anxiety of performance, and the A point entry level on performance, right? And so, for us to achieve this, multiple regression, let's start first with simple regression. 
And with a simple regression, we said that simple regression takes place when we have one dependent variable and one independent variable. To run it, you go to To run it, you go to analyze, regression. Under regression, you see a, a range of different regression techniques. We've mentioned that uh, we are interested in linear. So you take linear, you put your dependent variable in the independent variable and the dependent box, and then the independent variable and the independent box. So I want us to examine the effect of studying on So you can go to your statistics. At this particular point, we just maintain everything. Plots will not plot anything. Self will not save anything. And so we just take OK. So here we have our output. We have our output. Now, with our output, we first of from the first table. And from the first table, it basically established the variables we have entered in our model. For instance, we see that we have entered variables are as pen revising. And uh, the method of analysis we're using is a default, which is enter. Then our dependent variable is the exam score. And so all variables were entered at once. Then we want to examine the overall effect, right? We want to examine the overall effect of our dependent variable on the independent variable. Now we have the model summary, which is the first table that we see. Under the model summary, we have, we have a single model. That's why we have model one. We have R. Now, if you look in, you discover this, the value of R here is equivalent to what? The correlation coefficient that we saw, right? The Pearson correlation coefficient. So the value of R here is the same. So when we do with simple regression, our correlation coefficient and uh, the value of adjusted R, which is uh, um, a value of R squared here, or R in our model summaries will be the same. But if you're dealing with multiple regression, that is different. So we have R squared. R squared is also known as adjusted uh, R squared. It's also, no, it's also known as coefficient of multiple determination. Coefficient of multiple determination. Now, what is the use of coefficient of multiple determination? It helps us to examine the overall effect of our dependent independent variables on the dependent variable. So what are we saying? We are saying to what extent, what is the effect contributed by all the independent variables we have inputted in our data, entered in our model on the dependent variable? Now, when we want to adjust for the degree of freedom, we have adjusted R squared. So when we have more than two independent variables, most often we use by adjusted R squared. Some people use R squared, but we, use, we can use adjusted R squared, which means we have taken care of the degree of freedom. Then we have standard error of estimation. Our deviation is like, uh, it's not really the error term, but it tells you how far you are you are, you, are, you, are, you, are, you are actual deviate from the expected. We love when the value is very small. But when it's small, it shows that our accuracy level is high. But this one, it was small here, it's relative. But that is our standard error of estimation. So the adjusted R squared, or even our R squared range between 0 and 1, the value is between 0 and 1. So you expect, always expect your R squared to be between zero and one. And how you interpret this value 
is that you convert it into a percentage. So if we were to interpret this value, we will say that 65, 67.4% variation in exam score is accounted for by what? The time spent studying. So in other words, the model summary gives us the possibility to examine the combined effect of our independent variables. That is the essence of our model summary. If you have any issue, you stop me, ask your question. Don't wait, I get to the end before you. You can ask at any point that you have a challenge. So that is the first thing that we have seen, which is the model summary when it comes to interpretation. So if we had to interpret, we say the overall effect or the air combined or the, the, the effect of our independent variable on the dependent variable is about 67.4 or the variation. In other words, if you have 67.4% variation in time spent studying accounted for by, I mean, on, on exam performance accounted for by, by time spent studying, then our error margin or the other parts, let's say 70, this minus 100 should give us the portion. Maybe this should be. So seven should be around 33 or so 30, I think 33.6 or so. Variation or 33.2. Variation is accounted for by other factors not included in our model. That's interpreting the model summary. The next is the model fits. Now our model fit, when we saw under regression, we say mean square error, this and that. We don't really go into this when we're doing ANOVA. But here, our interest is to verify if our model is a good model. Yes, we are saying that uh, uh, time spent studying affects what? Performance, if that is really true, if that model is valid. And to do that, we check the F value and its probability. The expectation is that if our F value is significant, then we have a reliable model. So our model is reliable and up for us to interpret the coefficients, which is the last table that we'll see here. So here we see that our F is 32, 37.225, which is large and the probability is 0 0.00 less than 0 0.05, which is, and so we can conclude that what? We have a reliable model. And so if we're interpreting the coefficients here, they will give us valid results, especially we have evaluated the other assumptions. So we come to the last table, which is the table of coefficients. Why the summary model gives us the combined effect, the coefficients give us the individual effect. We saw yesterday that a unit change in time spent studying will lead to maybe a certain proportion change in what? In our dependent variable, which was academic performance. So here we have our constant 22.44 which we all agree yesterday that it, it represented a part of our dependent variable not accounted for by our, I mean, by our independent variables that were, or the independent variables that were included in the model. So whether we have the student study or not, there's a possibility that the student can have a mark, let's just say of 22, right? So that's what we are saying. Now, and it's also significant. So the next thing is our coefficient for the time spent studying. The value here is 0 0.992. We have two types of values when we come here. We have unstandardized coefficients and standardized coefficients. Standardized and unstandardized. So with the standardized, unstandardized coefficient, 
we are trying to check the change of a one unit on in our independent variable and how our dependent variable will change. Now, what happens here is that we maintain our unit of scale. We maintain our unit of scale. In which case, if we check here, if we're measuring as, we still have as, if the other one is max, it will still be max. But the, on, but the standardized is that we now bring everything between zero and one. I know we talk about the Z score, right? Such that the values range between zero and one. So if our results, the higher the value, the better the effect of our independent variable on the dependent variable. So this value is 0.821, and which is closely, this is actually the coefficient that we have seen. 0.8 to this and uh, point. So we see that they are still the same, right? Yes. So the standardized is like the correlation coefficient that we are seeing here. So now persons may interpret based on the correlation coefficient, which means I mean the standardized values or use on standardized. So if we were to interpret our results based on the unstandardized, they were saying that a one unit change, preferably a one unit increase, since our sign is positive. I know I'm talking with advanced statisticians, and so uh, when I say some of these things, they already understand. So I don't need to be singing over and over, saying the same thing day in and out. At least we are already professionals. Not be so. Okay. So we have 0.992. What this implies is that a unit increase in time spending, in time spend revising, will lead to 0.992 increase in our performance or the exam score. In other words, let's assume that we measured our exams in terms of marks or one mark whatsoever, right? And we measure time spent in hours or one minute. So we could say that when we increase studying by one minute, right? What happens? Our marks will increase by 0.992. Everything here constant. Other factors here constant. Do we get that? That is a basic interpretation. Why, if we're using this standardized, we're trying to say that if we have a one unit uh, change, we have 0.82 standard deviation variation in our dependent variable. This one is written with respect to standard deviation. We have this change in our independent, the dependent variable. Now, when we have interpreted the coefficients, we can now have our t value. Yes, this is the change that we'll have on our dependent variable. But is that change significant? We want to draw that conclusion with the help of what? Our t and its probability, right? If we look at our t, we discovered as 6.101, and the probability is 0 0.00. Based I know that you expect that most often, since we have our C to be 6 point this, which is greater than 0 0.2, I think it was 1.96 or something like that. I've forgotten the, the cutoff zone for like 9%. So this high probability will be significant. And so here, the value is 6, and the probability is 0, 0, which means it's highly significant. So in sum, when we go to the coefficient, what are we looking for? One, the nature of the relationship. And that is gotten by looking at the coefficient, the sign of the coefficient of the unstandardized value. The sign here is positive, meaning that time spent revising and exam score, they move in the same direction. The more you revise, the more there is a possibility of increasing your exam score. That's the first thing we are establishing from that resource. 
The second thing we want to establish is the effect. To what extent is the time spent revising affecting our exam score? We said that if we increase the time spent by one minute, then there's a possibility that we will increase our exam score by 0.992. And finally, that result is significant given our T value. Be clear? Any worry? Oh, sir. Yes. Sir, let me, uh, in, interpret, in, in interpreting the result, what is the significance of that of the 22.64? What is the significance in, in, the, in the result obtained? Where is the 22.64? I'm not saying 22.164. We say it's a constant. It's a constant. Yes. Okay, it's a constant. constant. Pardon? I'm saying that we don't have to use it when we want to interpret the result. If you want to use it, you can use it. If you don't use it, it's not a problem. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, yeah. sir, it's okay. Any worry again? And the human beings are angry. Hmm. Okay. No worry. So Let's do now multiple regression by adding all our variables. So when we add our independent variables, the same concept applies, right? Now, if you come now, you discover that our R squared has increased, or our adjusted R squared has increased. And uh, we also notice that our standard error is reducing. Why is it reducing? Because we're gathering more information to be able to predict what academic performance, right? Your standard error of estimation it reduces the more you capture your independent variable, right? The more you are able to predict your independent variable. So the standard error helps us a lot when we're trying to do regression to capture the, the errors that are coming from our results. And so what we notice here is that we see our model is still significant. But now, for the model summary, we are saying that 83.4, right? Listen, we have more than one variable now. we we'll use better adjusted arrow squared. And we're saying that 83.4% variation in our exam score is accounted for by the independent variables in our study, which are time study, time spent studying or revising, a level of anxiety, and a level entering point. That is what we are saying. And we have a reliable model, which means the model that our data fits the model very well. We have a predictive power. We can predict and have reliable outcome from our results. 
Now, we look at the effect, individual effects. Now, since we have added more variables, we see that time spent revising, a unit increase in the time spent revising will lead to 0.551 increase in exam performance. The relationship is still positive and that relationship is still significant. I'm sure what I've said is explicit. We have anxiety. Anxiety, a unique increase in anxiety will lead to 0 0.04 increase in exams performance. Now the anxiety we are asking you, is it negative anxiety or positive anxiety, right? Anxiety can be negative or positive. In this case, it seems as anxiety contributes positively towards academic performance. Uh, what is our theoretical expectation? Did we say anxiety referring to fear or the zeal to go and write, right? So, but then that relationship is insignificant, which means anxiety is not a major predictor of scores. And finally, we see that another major predictor of your performance or the performance is what? Entering level point. A level point says, shows that if we increase points by 1.898, uh, 1.989, then, I mean, sorry, by one unit, our performance will improve by 1.989. Improving the points. Let's say if we are supposed to go to UB with five points, if you go to UB with six points, then your performance will increase, increase by 1.989. In other words, I was trying to establish. And uh, we see that uh, it's also significant. Now at times we try to use, uh, we can use the standardized values to predict which of the factors has the highest influence on our dependent variable. The one with the highest standardized value indicates the one with the highest influence. Or if you look at it, in most cases, the one with the highest T value also will simply tend to have the one to give us the, the, the highest effect. That's why if you check even from the betas, we have 1.8, 1.989, and it has the highest beta value of 0.581. This is followed by the value for uh, the beta for time spent revising, which is 0.54. And if you look at the T value similar, right? Yes, the highest T value comes from the A point level followed by the time spent revising and the lease is, so that is the information we get. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow Cameroonians of goodwill, any problem? Any worry? Any worry? It's very easy, right? I think this is all about regression.
Any worry? So we have our model summary which helps us to establish our rule effect of the independent variables included in our study on the dependent variable. Then from there, we have our model fit assessment table, which is ANOVA. And we stated that uh, we are using the F value and its probability to decide whether the test is significant, the, the, the model is a good fit or not. And uh, we also said we have our coefficients, which examine individual effects. Under the coefficients, we are looking at standardized values and unstandardized, and then the T decide whether it's significant. First, the first thing we want to examine is the nature of the relationship between our independent variables and the dependent variable. And to help us attain or assess that, we look at the signs. If you have a negative value, then it implies that there's a negative relationship. For instance, if anxiety was negative, it means increasing anxiety will lead to what a decrease in performance. But if anxiety is positive, it means increase in anxiety leads to increase in performance in academics. That's basically what we're trying to say. And the next thing we said was that what is the effect of this? value. Now to get the effect, we basically look at the value we have on our table and the interpretation is that a unit increase at times of people say 1% will lead to this percent uh, if you try to convert in terms of percentages. But we're saying that a unit increase or decrease if we have a negative value, right? For instance, anxiety, we will say that a unit increase in anxiety will lead to what? A zero point a, a point one zero four decrease in exam score. But since it is positive, the way we interpret this is that we say that a unit increase in anxiety will lead to point zero four increase in our exam score. All right? Similarly, the same situation for the entry point. If we improve our entry points by one unit, then our performance in terms of ex in the exams will be will increase by what? 1.989 units. Now this has to do with the currency of measurement, right? Yes. And same for time spent, time spending. Here we are trying to express now the challenge we may have using the unstandardized is that we cannot do comparison. Right, because time span giving us 0.551 uh, anxiety is this, but then what happens is that these items are measured using different skills. Time span is measured in us, anxiety may be measured, maybe strongly agreed to whatsoever it was used, and then entry level point is measured maybe in terms of the GC performance or whatever. Right, so we have different measurement skills. And so in order for us to neutralize this, we use the standardized. Standardized simply means we try to, to bring them to a common denominator where we can do comparison now across different. Yeah. So saying that we see here, we can now assess the individual effects using a common unit. So we have our T values that help us draw conclusion whether the test is significant. Ladies and gentlemen, any question? If we don't have a question, I think we'll end here. I'll give exercise.
for you to do over the weekend. We come on Sunday. We'll likely finish regression on Sunday. Linear regression on Sunday. We'll come and do correct the exercise. And from that exercise, we'll test the assumptions. We've not tested assumptions. We've just gone ahead to test the regression. We'll go and test assumptions and verify other related things that are important for us to know before we proceed with our class. So if we don't have a question, I think we can end here for this week. Uh, the assignment that you'll be given, uh, I will suggest that you do the assignment because uh, it will be very, very vital for you in the coming days. Yesterday, we all agreed that everybody should finalize his or her financials. I don't know if some persons are still owing. I expect that they should clear the account. Without much we do, Econ, are you with us? Addison participated online. Erika, uh, Solange, Mr. Ed Sue. Who is not there? I think there were five persons or six. Who is not there now? Uh, Doug, uh, Mr. Nobel, Shenzi, have not all been attending classes. So, any worry from anybody? No. Okay. Madam Erica. I'm fine, no, I'm okay, I'm okay, no worries. Okay, good to know. Ekon? Ekon, you seem not to be active today, I don't know why. But you have been distracted. You just came and signed in and you have not been reacting. Okay, we end it here for today. Thank you for participating and I'll see you within the week. Welcome. There can be a strong negative but insignificant relationship. Yes, it's possible.